Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Miro. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Tibli. And I want to talk to you a little bit about code standard data. Um, for those of you around the back, if you can't see, just in case, the slides are on GitHub. I've got a very distinctive name, so you could probably find me quite easily. And I'll keep that on screen just for a second so I can tell you a bit about myself. Um, so my background is in natural language processing. I did a PhD in what we used to call at the time word vectors. Since then, people started calling them embeddings. And then I moved on to the startup world, working in various kind of smaller companies in what we call now real world data science projects. Um, I'm currently working at Tibli, which is a communications platform for lawyers and accountants and anyone who really exchanges sensitive information, but is a little bit stuck in the 20th century with their practices. So mostly small companies. Um, so let's get going. The first thing that we think about when we talk about machine learning is that it's always a combination. It's this trifecta of three factors that contribute to the success of your project. There's obviously the data, right? That's why it's called data science. Um, you've got the algorithms that you use to extract something useful out of your data. And then there's the actual question. What is it that you're after? And in order to get a good project, you need all three of them. If you're asking the wrong question, no amount of data and no amount of sophisticated model tuning will get you anything useful. If you've got a really difficult question, um, that's beyond the capabilities of modern machine learning, something like sarcasm detection. I mean, it's difficult enough for a human to do, let alone for a machine, then it's also a pretty tough project. And finally, there's the data component. You might have the technology, you might have the question right, if you haven't got the data that contains the answer, well, then you're also out of luck. And what happens if you go to meetups around the city is that every business event is about, hey, how do we ask the right questions? Every tech event is about the algorithm. How do we tune that model to get something useful out? How do we make the business people happy? And people don't talk about the data that much. So your choices when it comes to data are really not that great. You can go and try and download something of, on online. Now, in the NLP community, everyone loves the Pentry Bank. That's been around for 25 years. Pretty much anything NLP related, you go download the Pentry Bank and it's essentially free. If you can't do that, which is very, very often the case, um, you have to try and buy something or just strike a partnership with a company who has the data. And that's a really tough one. You never know what you're buying and the moment you start business negotiations, especially these days with GDPR, any kind of third party data sharing is very, very difficult. Um, you could try web scraping, but that's half legal depending on where you are. And it could be worse than, well, anything really else out there. The web is really, really messy. Or you could get the data out of some internal system like Zoopla, you know, if they wanted to predict uh, house prices, well, they've got 40 million houses that have been on the record. And it's not always that easy to extract, but in some shape or form, the data is already within the organization. You just need to go and get it. And failing all of those, you have to go and make your own data set. And that's what I want to talk about today. So the question is, how do we create a good gold standard data set for supervised machine learning? And the sad takeaway is that there isn't the right formula. There isn't just a silver bullet that you can apply to any problem and then it would get you everything that you want. However, what we can do is talk about a few case studies, things that I've worked on and people around me, talk about what challenges we face there and then ask ourselves some questions and see maybe how we could have addressed those challenges better. Um, the, key, the key kind of insight to keep in mind is this off-sighted maxim that if garbage goes in, garbage is going to go out. So the question that we really want to think about is, how does the garbage get made? And what can we do to stop garbage from being made and wasting our time? So let's look at a few case studies. The first one is again word embeddings. I'm going to do a very quick intro just in case, but I guess by now everyone would have heard of those. Um, so word embeddings are this concept from computational linguistics that you can represent words as vectors. And then vectors will become point in uh, a high dimensional space. And it's a completely radical change in how we think about it. It's not a new idea. It goes back to the early 60s, if you want to trace it back, properly kind of mid-90s. But 
It's quite easy to train because you don't need an awful lot of label data or any. It's been going, going really up in popularity recently. And more, most importantly, there's some interesting semantic properties. So everyone's doing word embeddings now. And everyone's saying, well, I've built this new word embedding algorithm. And I wonder, well, is that any better than the previous one? And this is what I was trying to do my doctorate on. We've got some stuff. How do we know if this model that we've built is actually better than the previous so-called state of the art? And how we used to do it is by falling back on this concept of distance between vectors, essentially being the same as similarity between words. So you go, right, if you ignore this half for now. If I asked a bunch of you, how similar is cat to dog? Most people would say, well, I don't know, about eight out of 10. Whereas cat and democracy are nowhere near as similar. And because in a, in a word embedded space, we have vectors, we can do the exact same thing and query a model. So if you ask the model, it might say, you know, cat and dog are similar to a degree of 0.76 and cat and democracy 0.6. The numbers are completely made up, by the way. So the evaluation basically falls out. And the key thing here is these numbers on the left are provided to us by humans, the ones on the right by the machine. And then we can tell whether the machine is doing well by comparing it to what the humans have told us. So if you have the scores assigned by the machine and the scores assigned by the human, and you see good correlation between them on a scatter plot like that on the left hand side, then you've built a model that's good and decent. And on the right hand side, we've got a crappy model that's not worth anything. And this is all very nice and well. It's super easy to implement it's about one to three lines of your programming, your favorite programming language. The question really is, is that a good thing to do? Like, let's evaluate the evaluation, really. Um, first of all, let's ask what it is that we're asking people to do. Now, what is it that makes words similar? Now, without going too much into the philosophy of it, there's been some discussions going back about 150 years in the philosophical literature. And people say, look, there's topical relatedness, a rice, a packet of rice is similar to a bowl because, well, rice goes into the bowl and then goes into your belly. So that's obviously that there's something there, right? There must be some similarity. Cats and dogs, well, they kind of look the same. They're furry, four-legged animals. They're cute. People like them. So they must be similar. And so on. But in order to define, in order to get people to give you this concept of similarity and basically assign a number given a pair of words, you need to explain to them exactly what it is that you're asking. And if you try to do that, you very quickly find out that there's a million corner cases that you haven't thought about. Stuff like antonyms, words with supposedly opposite meaning, like big and small. Is that similar or is it not? What you get if you ask 100 people, you get a bimodal distribution. Half of them think, yeah, of course it's similar. I mean, they can be used in exactly the same context. They're both adjectives. They fit in, they're basically substitutable in context. Therefore, they must be similar. And others will say, well, no, of course they're not. Big is the exact opposite of small. They can't be similar. So it's that kind of thing that you have to pin down before you start thinking about your data. And if you don't, what you get is this popular academic data set, which I'm not going to name. But the scores there uh, between cat and tiger range anywhere from 5 to 9 on a 10-point scale with a good standard deviation. The second question is, right, imagine you could magically somehow materialize a bunch of perfect instructions for the annotators and you know exactly what you're looking for and you can communicate that to, to these humans in English, which you're not going to be able to do quite frankly because it's very difficult to communicate precisely in natural language. But suppose you could do that. Can you even do that task? Like given perfect communication, some things are just subjective. Like if I ask you to judge whether something is sarcastic, on Reddit, completely out of context, well, it's quite hard to say. We all understand what sarcasm is, but you just wouldn't be able to say. And if we had a show of hands about this cat-tiger example, we're going to get a pretty mixed bag as well. And I'm not going to try it because I did once before. And what we got is the people who put their hand first influenced everyone else and completely skewed the sample. Uh, the moral of the story is experimental psychology is really hard. But do try it at home independently. So what can we do here? The first most important thing, and that's probably not a surprise to anyone, is to write down these annotator guidelines or the instructions of what you're asking people to do. Write them down early, even if it's just you working on the project for now. 
And that first way, that will help you figure out what it is that you're doing. And it would also clearly define the issues. So by the time you have, uh, you get to the point where you're talking to other people, you will have already figured out some of the major issues and it would make your job a lot easier. So write things down yourself, try and do the job a little bit yourself, see if you can do it. Um, and then go to your friend, ask your friend, ask them if it makes sense. And if it doesn't, then you probably have to simplify. And simplify means compromise. Like if you're asking them to do something where the distinctions are very, very slight and they can't do it, well, can you do something that's a bit coarser grain, something simpler for people? And that will depend on your business case. Now, in many cases, and yes, that totally is an excuse to just squeeze a cat photo in because that cat's just adorable. Um, in many cases, for the business use, it's fine to be able to tell a cat from a dog. And that's all you ever need to do. That's a quite a simple task. You don't need anyone uh, who's been trained. Now, is it worth having a model that can differentiate between different dog breeds? Well, yes, probably, but most people can't do that. Um, studies have been done and it's really, really difficult even for people who've had training. So can you get away with something simpler and therefore cheaper and quicker? The next important question is, do we have quality, right? We've got some people in the data is being produced, we're recording it. How do we know if it's actually good data? That's probably the most important question that we ought to ask ourselves. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it, depending on what kind of data you're gathering exactly. You can do inter-annotator agreement by taking two different people, asking them the exact same set of questions, and then comparing the results. And if they get the same results, or nearly the same, then you know that they're doing a good job. Um, if you have a gold standard data set, which works and you trust, then you can compare your people's answers to that gold standard data set. Or you can do uh, random changes and Stack Overflow does that amazingly well. So we'll just look at a quick example. How many of you have tried to edit anything on Stack Overflow? Okay, only a handful. So the job there is you go and you ask a programming question and if your question doesn't make any sense or it's badly formatted or grammatically incorrect, people can suggest edits and then, peop and then someone else will go and they'll review those edits and say, okay, that's not vandalism, it's a completely legitimate edit, that actually improves the question. And if you go and start approving the edits, you, you get a view that looks like this. It's basically a git diff with insertions and deletions in red. And every now and then as you edit, Stack Overflow will throw something like this at you are completely nonsensical and if you reject it, you get this. It's just a test. So what they're literally doing is throwing some garbage at you and checking if you're paying attention. And you'll be surprised how many people actually fail that very simple test. Now it's a really easy procedure that you can have in your own data gathering, especially if you go crowdsourcing, because that will give you a surefire way of weeding out the people who are just making a living on Crowdflower clicking through without reading what you've actually asked them to do. Um, the next thing that kind of helps with improving your quality is to think about a little bit the human aspect of it. Like, why is that annotator there? Why are they doing the job for you? Are they paid by the sentence or by the annotation? Did you just get them online? If they are, well, then they'll probably try and rush it, like you do on Stack Overflow, to get it all over quickly and, and get paid. If they're paid by the hour, they'll take their sweet time and they'll make sure to cover it up by just giving you a lot of false positive annotations. So if you ask them to find you named entities in text, that's the next case study that we'll come to, well, they'll find you an awful lot of them because you paid them by the entity and they want to justify their paycheck. Um, in a bigger organization, you could go and borrow a domain expert from another team, but then they'll have a manager to report to, they'll have their own deadlines. So about two hours in, they'll be like, man, I need to go now, can I, can I go? and they'll just rush through again. Or if they're members of your own team, well, they're not gonna want to tell you that you're asking them a stupid question, right? To avoid causing conflict. Or maybe they will if they already hate you anyway. So, one thing that I didn't do early on when I was doing that kind of work is to run those checks constantly. Fine, you've defined a concept of what good means, but you have to be doing that check all the time so that you can weed out these problems early on. 
which might mean there's a good engineering effort involved in actually making sure that this works with the software that you're using. And one very important thing to watch out for is any systematic biases or errors. If you keep seeing the same mistake being made over and over again, then you probably haven't done your instructions correctly or you haven't understood the problem yourself. The best way to, to figure that out is go and talk to the annotators. Ask them something like, what's difficult here? Why is it so hard? Why do you keep messing this up? And then they'll probably say, oh, you know, I wasn't quite sure what you're asking here. But they wouldn't say that up front if you ask them, is everything clear? Because no one likes to be exposed. So if you literally, the first thing you ask them is, is it clear? They'll go, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. That's a little bit of a cultural thing, obviously. And because you're watching for errors constantly, and you have a good way of checking your quality, you'd be able to say very quickly if what you're doing is not worth doing at all, and then you can iterate. Just scrap it, start over. That's fine, it's part of life. So the next question is, well, if we throw some data away, do we have enough to actually train a model? And obviously we can get around this if we haven't got much, we can generate some fake data. We'll come back to that in the end. Um, we can find a more efficient machine learning model that just learns better with less data. But you can also ask yourself, well, how much do I really need? In that case, go take a look at your learning curve. If you see a learning curve like that, that's already kind of leveling off, well, you don't really need an awful lot of data. And that's why you would want to have an iterative process. After every batch, you train the model, see if it's still trending up, and then at least you know whether it's worth spending any more time and effort on that. In this particular case, I'd say no, because we are up, at nine, up to 98 with only 1,200 examples. That's fine. Um, if I went down here at 200, having done one day of work, I would think, well, this is looking kind of promising, right? We can get up to 91%. It's all right. Um, that takes us to the next case study, which is symptom recognition in medical notes. And what the, what the task is, is to find diseases and their causes. You might have something like this. If it says abdominal pain due to tonsillitis, which is completely nonsense medically speaking, um, you might want to say that abdominal pain is a symptom and the thing causing it, the disease causing that symptom, is the tonsillitis. Now, that sounds really easy. Even I could do it, except in practice it's not. If you've ever been to an NHS doctor, the notes that they actually produce at the end of the appointment would be a little bit more like this. Um, and that's really because they'll have about 45 seconds before the next really sick person rushes in. Um, oh yes, and by the way, this is based on the doctoral work of my office mate, Alex, who isn't here today. So I'm kind of ripping him off very happily. Um, I did insert a citation towards at his uh, thesis, so it's fine, I reckon. So the moment you start dealing with data that's this messy, you are in a completely different ballpark. Like it's even the, even the most basic NLP task, like tokenization, being able to find boundaries between words, just goes out the window because you can't use any of the existing tools. There are no, like how is that slash different to these two? How, why would that guy be using a double forward slash as a word separator? No idea. And these abbreviations that doctors use are basically <coughs> impossible to decode. So if you really need to do that job, you're not going to be able to do it yourself. You're going to have to get a specialist in. And the problem with the trained doctor is that they don't like to do that thing. No one really likes to do it, but especially very highly trained doctors. So you have a really, really hard time convincing them to come and work with you. Medical students tend to be a bit more agreeable if you throw 50 quid at them, but they give up really, really quickly because it's a really annoying job to do. Um, and if you get them in, you'll discover that they're not experts in linguistics or machine learning and you're not a medical expert. So it's a really difficult conversation to have when you go, well, I want you to find me all the noun phrases. And then they go, hold on, what's a noun phrase? Is it like when I have a disease or whatever? I, I can't even speak like a doctor, sorry. <laughs> so the challenge you're going to have is talking to them in a language that they understand and understanding what they're saying to you. And that's a very long and iterative process. The next question is, if you've got them in, are you going to be able to keep them? Because as we said, they don't like to do that kind of work. No one really does. So what you should be thinking about is, am I willing to waste the two hours of this guy's time that I'll get? And this would be the only two hours that you get 
because they have better things to do. Um, do I want to waste it on something that I haven't iterated on myself first? So we're back at become the expert at your data. Figure out the problem first yourself. Make sure you can do it as well as a layperson could possibly do it. And then spend your finite and very expensive resource on labeling that data set. So make sure that you're asking your people the right question. Um, depending on what you're doing, you're going to need some specialist software. Now, with word similarity, a spreadsheet is good enough. You throw it all on Google Drive and you're good to go. With name identity recognition, which is what this symptom detection is, you're going to need slightly better software. And that has to be, from a technical point of view, not crappy. It has to be able to work. You have to be able to install it and maintain it, which is not something that I can, unfortunately, say of most of them out there. Um, and you have to think about how you plug in your continuous monitoring into that framework. And most importantly, how do you make sure that there's some data access in place? Like if you're dealing with medical data, anything cloud-based is a no-no, and anyone looking at it is going to have to sign 25 letters of pages of NDAs. So you can't go onto any cloud-based services, and the, most of the time the data won't be even allowed to leave the premises. So people will have to come to you. And from a non-technical point of view, you're going to want something that works. Works for you, not against you, which sadly is again not the case for most of the software that's out there. And it increases your productivity, and again, bug-free, because if it crashes a few times, your doctor is just going to go, well, I mean, the new Game of Thrones is coming up next week, so I'll just do that instead. Um, for name identity recognition specifically, there's a couple of pieces of software that have been quite popular. Um, Crowdflower, Mechanical Turk are kind of off the shelf, generic frameworks. You write a little bit of code yourself to get the task set up. Um, for medical stuff specifically, you might not be able to use them because they're mostly cloud-based. There was Brat, horribly named, used to be a really nasty piece of software to install, but now with Docker, things have gotten a lot better, so you can just get it and run it. Um, Prodigy is the new kid on the block. Everyone's really raving about it, but I've actually got mixed reviews from people. Like for the two use cases that it was built for, it's apparently it's amazing. But then if you try and push it a bit further, I hear it's not amazing. Um, but that's second-hand experience. Or you can try and write something custom in-house. We've done that at the job, and it always takes longer than you think. The next question is, once we've moved over to this second case study, how can we measure agreement between people or between a gold standard and the person that's doing the labeling? Um, with word embeddings, that was really easy. You put your scores in Excel. Even Excel will give you a correlation score. Easy peasy. With that, it's a real mess. You get this, this one symptom is now split into two. Some of the boundaries are not aligned. Some will be missing. This one's completely off. The adjective's gone. It's really not that easy because you need to think about partial overlap and also you need to account for the fact that if people just randomly select entities, they're going to do quite well, especially on very short documents. So there's, a, there's an entire body of literature. There's the PhD thesis of my friend. So go and take a look at that. Um, and then, as if it wasn't painfully clear that paper wish, people issues would be the biggest challenge that you face. Yes, people issues. Um, I, I like to argue every now and then, provoke data scientists by telling them that one good annotator will contribute more to the success of a project than an entire team of data scientists because garbage in, garbage out. If you get one good person who just consistently churn out quality labeled data and you put that into a naive base classifier, you're probably gonna get a better model than if you spend one person here optimizing the fanciest deep neural net you can think of. So find a good person who does the job well enough, train them, and then nurture that relationship. And if you're in the same room, that works amazingly well because it just completely removes this feedback cycle of, okay, I will let you work for five hours and then you go on holiday for two weeks and then you send me an email if there was any question. And by the time you're back from your holiday, you would have completely forgotten what you were doing, so we have to retrain you again. Just put them in the same room. It's very inconvenient, but at least it makes sure that um, they're not doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. 
and it eliminates these like day-to-day -day things like, oh yeah, my internet connection is very patchy, my baby is crying, I couldn't do any labeling now because I was distracted. That, that tends to introduce an awful lot of errors in practice. Um, finally, crowdsourcing. It can be very cost effective, really cheap. I've personally had more negative experiences than positive experiences, to be honest. But that probably says something about how I set up the methodology and what I was doing, rather than the people that I was getting. But it's still a fairly risky endeavor because you're working with people that you've never talked to, you haven't properly trained. They will be clicking quite randomly because a lot of them would be making a living. So they'll try and get it over with as quickly as possible. You have to think about security and you have to think about the language barrier. Now, in English, it's not so terrible. Um, we did some work in Swiss German and turns out there's only like seven or eight million Swiss German speakers in the world and most of them do not care about a job that pays seven pounds an hour. So it's very, very difficult to get anyone online who can do that kind of thing for you. But if you do, uh, let's throw a little bit about ethics. Um, these, these guys on the other end, they're people too, so you know, pay them, pay them fairly for their time, treat them respectfully. And if you don't want to pay them well, you get what you pay for at the end of the day. If you find anyone who's good, make sure that you give them a little Christmas card or whatever, keep them around, because they'll be very, very useful for the project. Um, how are we doing for time, guys? All right. Um, and the final case study is address matching. So this is something that we're actively working on at Tibli. And the use case is this. We've got a small law firm and they're sending out a lot of letters. And how it works at the moment is the lawyer, the senior lawyer will have like a, a physical outbox and a desk chat on their, print, on their desk and they'll click print at the end of the day. They'll put it in the outbox and then the secretary will lick stamps, put it all in the envelope and walk over to the post office. And you hope that they haven't forgotten to put one of those sheets in the envelope because that actually happens to a customer of ours. And that particular contract was uh, a bit contentious. They went to court and it turned out it's completely void because they didn't sign the one page. Um, so the objective here is the lawyer will be just uploading some documents into a system. And then these documents need to be zero integration for them. They, they, they're not allowed to change any of their existing systems because they're so okay and you don't want to touch that. So they just upload the PDF and then we'll find the intended recipient address and match that to a digital account on the system and then they'll receive it digitally so the secretary wouldn't have to walk over to the post office. So what we're after is given a document, find the address, structure the address, make sense of it and then match it to an address that the user put in when they signed up in a potentially different format without any false positives because that would be really, really expensive for us. So the question is here and the biggest challenge we had, where do you even get the raw data? Like fine, we will spin up an annotation pipeline, we'll get people in to label that data. Where do you get the raw addresses? Now, there are no address databases out there. There's open street maps, but it's a bit patchy and it's not entirely clear whether you can use it for commercial purposes, so you're left with buying it. If you wanna buy it, turns out that's also a very difficult thing to do. Especially now with GDPR, people are like, no, 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 you can't have the address data of my customers because then it's four million for me. So you can't even buy it. And if they're prepared to sell it for, to you, it will be super expensive and really, really messy because every website has its own address format and they store it in their own slightly messed up way. So you're really not, not sure what you're going to be getting. And again, you can try scraping and there are technically formats for embedding address information into HTML, but they're really crappy as well, so you don't get anything. So this is something that we did not anticipate well enough. We just thought, oh, you know, well, it's a sequence labeling problem. There's a whole bunch of really nicely working models out there. Um, we'll just go get some data and we'll be done with it in a week. Well, no, that wasn't the case. Um, the next thing we, we discovered very quickly is, fine, we've managed to get our hands on some data, we've labeled it, it's taken us so much time this far. It's not enough. The learning curve is properly pointing up, but it's clearly not generalizing well enough. So how do we scale that process? And the answer turned out to be, if you can't make it, just fake it. 
Depending on what sorts of data you're working with, you've got different options. Now with images, you can rotate them, you can translate them, you can apply all sorts of affine transforms. You can change the lighting, you can crop them, you can obscure parts of the images with a green box. And out of every single image, you can make a thousand new regions. If you're doing something like a spell checker or word predictor, you can just follow the error process that you know is driving what people are doing. Just swap some characters, replace a few words here and there, and that will give you some nice looking, realistic looking. It's not organic data, it's not the real thing, but it's close enough that in many, in many cases, when combined with some real data, it will get you quite far. And finally, what we did with addresses is mix and match. Like we'd get the street name from this one and the house number from that one and the post box field from the other and the postcode from another. They're completely, non completely made up addresses. They don't make any sense. There's like London, Switzerland works well enough. Um, it really does fix the problem. So in summary, the data labeling part is usually what you're going to be doing at the very beginning of a project, and it's a really, really hard one to do. So if you can't get that right, the project's probably dead in the water. So the best thing to do is spend some time on it, think very hard about it, um, get to know it, and become an expert in the problem domain. And don't be afraid to challenge your assumptions. Say we all make mistakes or we don't understand something first time around. So get people to sanity check you, and if it doesn't work, throw it away and make sure that you're monitoring your quality continuously so you don't end up with something that's completely useless. Thank you.